Okay, so the question is, what if after someone gets saved, they become a Satanist? I know it is a crazy question, but someone in my life keeps using this example to say eternal, sec eternal security isn't true. Okay, Ben, I guess you can answer that one first. Okay, I'm sure you guys will say a lot of things that will, that will remind me of more things to say, but uh, just an initial cut on this is that, again, uh, it, it, being born again, uh, being saved is an event, and it has nothing to do with what you do other than placing your faith in Christ alone, faith, your, your faith in Christ alone and his work alone. Um, so people could fall into all kinds of errors. Um, I do, I, I generally do. So again, uh, is it possible that someone could become, become a Satanist? I, I would, I would say theoretically, yes, but I, I think practically it's unlikely. Um, I think that, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. They could become a Satanist, but if they did, I don't think God would allow them to uh, continue on this earth. I think you'd take them home early. That's just my uh, my uh, um, conclusion based on what I see in Scripture. Uh, again, the way I, I, I... And I don't think it should be controversial, because I think, uh, to me, I'm a thousand percent convinced that both Hebrews and Second Peter, I think, are, are probably the two of the most difficult most contested uh, uh, books of the Bible of, of, of in terms of interpretation, but um, I, I'm absolutely convinced. I probably spent more time on those two books than any other. Um, I'm beyond a shadow of a doubt convinced that those are books that are uh, written, epistles written to born again believers, uh, telling them not to either fall into, go back, fall back into legalism, which is Hebrews, or fall back into license or licentiousness or lewdness, um, which is what Second Peter is about. And there's many parallels between those two books too. I mean, it, it's it's it, to me, it, it's very clear. Anyhow, um, so in both those examples, uh, both those examples, God uh, God warns uh, ahead of time uh, that hey, you are drifting, or you or there's going to be an opportunity that's going to be a strong temptation for you to, to fall away. And I'm telling you ahead of time exactly what's going to you know exactly. Uh, what the what the risk the, the the danger is and you should prepare yourself uh not to allow it to happen uh and if you do allow it to happen it's like you're completely negligent you're completely become blind or dull of hearing because um the the, the if you fall away it's like the worst kind of falling away like for example in hebrews you'd be falling away into crucifying christ again uh in in second peter uh, you, you would be falling back into basically drunken orgies and denying Christ. So in both those cases, I think there's a stern warning that if you do those things, God's going to, in this case, in, in the case of Hebrews and second Peter, not saying all cases for all generations, but to these specific Jewish believers, I believe he is warning them that you, you will be taken home early. Um, but again, you're giving warning, warning ahead of time. And I think even as you were to draw back, you're going to, God slowly turns up the heat uh, and if you don't respond to it, ultimately he will take you home. Um, that's my my interpretation. So again, people could could people become Satanists? I, again, I think it's possible. I, I think it's unlikely, uh, very unlikely. Uh, if they did, I, I personally would question whether they whether or not they really believed. Not because it's not possible, but just because uh, it just seems like a, a, an extreme departure to go from one extreme to the other. Um, and but again, I, I'm not saying I'm not denying it's not possible. In fact, First John talked that one of the as he ends his epistle says, uh, uh, "Little children, keep yourself from idols." Well, in Revelation, when he's in heaven, he actually worships an angel, and so that's idolatry. And so the very thing he was warning his congregation about, he found himself doing. He wore he was worshiping an idol. Or, I'm sorry, an, an angel, and the angel said, "Don't see that you do not do that." Um, Pretty much every sin you can think of, uh, where you know that is that the Bible shows it's it's it. If you if you're an unbeliever, will condemn you to hell. Ever there's an example in the Bible of a believer doing those very same things. But again, they're not they can't be condemned. But so they're, they're rather they're saying you know like for example the angel said see do see that you do not do that. Um, you know for example in Matthew uh, Matthew tells uh, at the end of Matthew Christ says. Make sure you know you do not become drunk and sleepy, and and you you, you become sluggish, uh, otherwise that day will come upon you as a thief. So he's warning them basically. There's 
don't rest. <laughs> don't rest because uh, you have not entered my rest. So you should you don't don't be resting. Uh, you should be awake at all hours and you know spiritually awake at all hours. Do, do not become drunken or carousing. Uh, and, and and it's funny because the next chapter in the Garden of Eden, Christ had to rebuke his disciples three times for sleeping. Because only Christ is the one that it, it, that that is awake and aware at all times, um, and again, that's if we're in Him, we, He satisfied all those things. So again, Christ is our substitute. I think that's the thing to understand is that did Christ ever worship the devil? No, he he was tempted by Christ, uh, Satan to worship him, but he um, he used Scripture to rebuke him, and he he uh, he passed that test. Christ passed every test that God would test us with, and He did it for us. He is our our uh, perfect substitute. So he lived the perfect life vicariously or by proxy or by, uh, uh, I don't know how, however you want to mention it. It's like Avatar, the movie Avatar. I've ever seen that where someone is operating uh, uh, their life on behalf of you, essentially. Um, it's the same cut, not same thing, but it, there's a, a parallel there, I guess, to some degree. Christ fulfilled everything that we God required us to do. Some people have question, hey, do I need you water baptized? Well, ask yourself, why was Christ water baptized? To fulfill all righteousness. So that even if we did not, if we failed to do that even most basic uh, commandment, he did it for us. So, um, again, someone could become a Satanist. It's possible, yes. In fact, actually, to be honest with you, I think, I don't want to steal Luke's thunder, but uh, if you are not walking in faith, I, I've heard, I, I'm recalling now, I, I, from a long time ago, I think Luke, you did this probably ten, five to ten years ago. I remember a sermon you did, sermonette about if you are not walking in through faith alone, in Christ alone, you essentially are a Satanist. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, I have a follow up question for you, Ben, when it's my turn. But I, uh, Renee, what do you say? Well, this is what I like to call a straw man. Uh, it's just another way these board shippers try to condemn the gospel and those that believe it. You want to go, oh, so you can just murder and fornicate and be a drunk and go be a Satanist and still be to heaven? Okay, first of all, they don't know what grace is then. If, if they think that hearing the gospel, knowing we've been reconciled to God, having the security we have in Christ actually motivates people to be evil, then they've never comprehended the grace of God. And they should know better. Because the only people I've ever seen go from being, quote, a Christian to Satanism were legalist. They were either in the Roman Catholic Church or they believed you had to live a certain way or you'd be tormented forever. And I've seen people believe that and go be a Satanist, but I have never in my life seen this straw man to where somebody gets the gospel, they're saved and sealed, and they go, you know what? I hate Jesus now, even though he died for me to give me the security I have, to let me know that God loves me and, and knew me before I was born and had a purpose for my life. No, I'm going to go worship the one that hates my guts. I'm going to go worship him. I've never seen it. Never seen a true Christian that understands the gospel, free grace, ever go to that time. It's just disgusting that they even ask this. But the purpose of saying it is to deny the simplicity in Christ. It's to give us a stupid straw man argument to say, oh, that was true. You can just do whatever you want. And what that proves to me is that they, one, aren't saved. Two, they hey, great. They think grace is some cloak of iniquity that when we're saved, we think, oh, good, I can just be as wicked as I want and still get to heaven. So they have no understanding of what we understand about the gospel. They, they really think that we just love sin. And that is why we think we tell people we have eternal security so that we can go on being wicked. And that's just it's sickening. You know, when people say this stuff, it's a straw man to to be against the message of the cross. That's the only reason people say this stuff, you guys. But let's take a look at it. Ben's absolutely right. Now, me, 
I agree with him. I'd be concerned. I'd be like, uh, does he really know the gospel? Did he really get saved? Because I don't know. Uh, I don't know what in the world could get me to go be a Satanist because because of what Jesus did for me, I love him back. So why would I go worship somebody I know hates my guts and wants my death? I mean, it makes no sense to me at all spiritually. But I guess it's technically possible. We do see in 1 Corinthians, it says, but I say that the things which Gentile uh, sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. So some of these saved people were having fellowship with devils. They were going uh, into Gentile uh, uh, pagan temples uh, and partaking in sacrifices to the devils. And so technically they were worshiping devils. So I guess it is uh, possible a person could do that. It seems here that they were doing it in ignorance. Uh, and Paul's telling them to get out of it. You know, I don't want you guys fellowshipping with devils. You should, you, what fellowship has light with darkness? Get out of there. And why is he saying that? Because you're of the light. And so the other thing I would imagine, if a person went to some satanic mass, black mass or something, which by the way is basically just a hatred of a Catholic church and we're not Catholic, but they uh, go in defiance of it. And I, I would imagine a born again person with the Holy Spirit in them walking into a den full of wicked, evil spirits that they would be grieved and sick to their stomach. I know there's certain things that happen. I feel so sick. My heart's sick. My chest is tight. I can't breathe sometimes. That's what happens when I'm in the presence of evil, things that grieve me, things that God says he hates. I feel it. I hate it. So I don't know how anybody could be in the presence of something so wicked and partake in it if they had this Holy Spirit. And every person that trusts Christ has the Holy Spirit. It says right here, um, uh, in whom, let me see, in whom we trusted, where is it? Hold on. In whom you also trusted, this is for Ephesians, right? After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also that after that you believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So once we're saved, we have the Holy Spirit and we're purchased by God. We are possession. We belong to God. Jesus said he will lose nothing. So if you're a possession of God, he's never going to lose you. Salvation is not in your hands, people. Once you're saved, it's in the hands of God and he is faithful. So this really is a trip up straw man argument that I don't really think even applies. Because I have, I don't, I, they'd have to deal with all of that. Let's say they dealt with the pain and, and, and the gut wrenching uh, grieving of the spirit quench the spirit so much that they could do this evil satanism straw man thing uh i'm i'm with ben i think they, their life would be snuffed out i think god would take them before he he'd use them as a vessel of dishonor a horror as a as a as a warning to others before he'd let his name be blasphemed i really do i i just think this is a straw man that has no real world real life possibility hmm okay wow. well we again I, I you may get tired of me re repeating myself but it's so clear in the scriptures that uh when we believe and get saved as ben said it's an event you know, Jesus likened it to being born physically. Once you come out of your mother's womb, that's history. It happened at a moment in time, and now it's done, and nothing can change the fact that you were born, and nothing can change the fact that you were born again from above uh, when you believe in Jesus. So uh, if a person worships Satan or well, no matter what they did, nothing will change it. Paul did this beautiful verse talk about not things above not things below nothing nothing in all creation he goes on and covers every possible scenario saying not this not that uh so i would say uh not even becoming a satanist would uh, uh change your standing as as a believer now is it likely uh does it happen uh you know who knows i i think it's very unlikely 
that someone who's really saved and really understands the gospel uh, would do that. But maybe, um, you know, people sometimes get hurt by God and they get angry and, and they, uh, they, they want to rebel against God and, 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 and their anger. I mean, if you've ever had some really tragic things happen in your life, a lot of people have turned against God uh, be, because their family was all killed and their house, when their house burned down and they're, they can't, hey, they're really, they really got saved, but they're just angry and they want to rebel and do something to try to get back at God. So I'm, I can imagine it happening, but I think it's probably very un, unlikely. Uh, but the important thing for us to understand is that uh, regardless, whether Satanism or anything else, uh, your, your standing before God is irrevocable, but your state changes. Um, I, I've said that uh, a person is, uh, through once you're born again to your last breath, your, your walk as a Christian will be either growing and maturing or backsliding. It don't, I don't think people ever remain static for long. They're either growing or they're backsliding. They don't just stay at some level, I don't think. Um, so um, so your, your, your state changes, but your standing cannot. Um, let me that's see, important. any more on that? What's that? Yeah, that's an important uh, distinction to make. Your position in Christ is permanent. And you're kept by the power of God. And by the way, it says through faith. So uh, I I do not believe a real born again person uh, will ever go that far. If they did, not saying it's not possible, unlikely, very unlikely, because of the grieving uh, we would feel and the temporal consequence for such rebellion. Also, what in the world would cause that? Like I don't I don't. I could get mad at God and say, why did you let this happen, God? I could not talk to him for a while, but I, I can't imagine ever going to worship Satan. That's just, you know, but I am glad the person asked it. So I'm not mad at the person that asked. I am upset with lordshippers that use this straw man argument to shake up the faith of babes in Christ and try to say, see, uh, grace or free grace or faith alone is wrong. Because if security was true, then you could just do anything you want and you could just do this. That is the thinking of an unregenerate mind. Anybody that would think that we believe grace and security is something that promotes more sin and rebellion against God. None of us believe that. It's just a, a philosophy and man's uh, vain thinking that causes this. So I'm actually glad the viewer sent that question in. And I hope you don't think my annoyance with the question was directed at you. It's directed at why the people say these things. It's to tear down the faith and to come against our blessed assurance in Christ. That's why. And they never run out of sneaky ways of doing that. And this is one of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like you said they don't understand grace. You know, when only the old man is under a law, and the law defines what's righteous and unrighteous. That's all it can do for an unsaved person. It can only define what's what's righteous and unrighteous. And and Christ, uh, Paul said, you know, uh, where there's no law, there's no offense. So if there's no law against Satanism, there's no offense. It grieves God, and He may take you home early, but it can't condemn you. The law condemns eternally. It, it 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 brings about God's wrath. And again, if there's a law that could give life, like, you know, for example, don't ever, you're saved by grace, but don't ever worship Satan. That is a law. I mean, and so that, that it would be a law that could, that could give life. And Paul said unequivocally that there, you know, there is no law that could give life, only the law of faith. Uh, in that, that is basically, you know, believing on Christ, be born again. Only the old man, old creation is under condemnation. Only this old, everything old is under condemnation. The old dragon, the old the earth, the old man. The Old Testament is mostly about condemnation. The New Testament is blessing. Uh, you know, the new man, the new Jerusalem, the new earth. Um, so, uh, again, you're, the, 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 under the new creation is under grace. Old, old creation is under condemnation, under law. And I, I think if you keep those two distinctions in there, that there's nothing 
that there's no law whatsoever. There's no offense any longer if you're in Christ. There, you're under no law whatsoever. The law is not for a righteous person. So if you're born again, there's no reason. You only put someone under a law who you don't trust or you who you think is going to you know step out of line. You don't Christ. You wouldn't put Christ under the law. I mean, he did. He he was born under the law so he could fulfill our obligations to it. But uh, he would. He doesn't need to be the law. He, he's, that's why he said he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He was. He, he again. He was. Uh, he was a mercy. Grace. He had a picture of grace over the law, even though he was. Uh, they thought they were, he was violating the law by by allowing his disciples to uh, pick great on the Sabbath, or that um, you know David's uh, eating of the showbread. What, even though it wasn't lawful for him, it was a picture of mercy being above the law. Or, or uh, There's something greater than the law, and that is uh, grace and mercy. So grace and mercy always trumps law. And, you know, someone saying someone worshiping Satan, you don't, don't do that. You know, every, every time someone says, you must not do this or, or you must do this, that is a law. And if you're, required, if you're relying on that, you're trusting in your flesh. And uh, Paul says we should not have any confidence in our flesh at all because... Uh, the the flesh avails nothing. Only the new creation counts. Ben, that was a great example of the showbread. You know, uh, I love how Jesus always trumped the religious strict Pharisees, right? Because he missed the heart of the law. Yeah, exactly. They stuck to the dead letter, but missed the heart of it. They'd let somebody die on the side of the road that had been robbed to keep from becoming unclean by touching a dead body. Because they'd rather, you know what I mean? Instead of helping the man, they walked to the other side of the street. Jesus even used that in a story. Because they, they what is it, strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Yeah, that's what the law does. It makes you self, selfish. And the yep. law, grace give, makes you selfless. Yeah, and none of that... Uh, uh, people that ask that, they, they don't understand about <clears throat> walking by grace either. It's not just we're saved by grace and then you go back to the law mind. Don't do this. Don't do that. Abstain from this. It, we walk by grace also. And grace, if you're abiding in it, teaches you to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. That's why I say if somebody does not ask that question and really think this, I'm like, do they even understand what grace does to the heart of a person? Like the real gospel, what, what, what we understand about Christ and how much we cling to that cross for everything. You know, it's just, it's such a religious question and such a straw man question. And, and the, the questioner actually admitted that people use this to deny our assurance in Christ. They don't like it, you guys. The bottom line is they don't like that certain people are assured of heaven that they don't feel are worthy or deserve it. And I'll have to dig it up, but Luke, you did a great uh, video about basically, I think you said the question was, are you a Satanist? And the, the, <laughs> the answer was yes, if you're not trusting Christ alone. Yeah, There's, sometimes people mention something, they remember a video I did 10, 12 years ago, and uh, oh, I've forgotten all about that. You're not for me, you're against me, absolutely right. <laughs> Renee, uh, I think that uh, uh, being um, in your state of mind uh, over this is perfectly biblical. Um, the, the theological expression would be righteous indignation, and there are times um, where certain things really set me off. I, it's a hot button where, boy, it really, like the worst is the Lord shippers who uh, are trying to impose legalism on us, but it makes me so angry because they are absolutely deluded that recognizing that they cannot follow the system that they're trying to impose on us and their, their hypocrisy and their delusion. So that that's really gets me going. Um,